what made you want to pick up the camera and start creating? Oh man, I um, there's kind of, there's two things. There's there there's like a there's a path here. Originally, I'm from uh, I'm from Nova Scotia, and I went to university in Halifax, and really small city, very working class, and there's not a lot going on there in terms of like it's very culturally rich, but it's like you know it's not like an epicenter of anything. So, my uh, my goal from day one was to like make videos and just try to get eyes on people and eyes on me who are like like-minded cool creators driven i found it really hard to find like a lot of ambition in halifax as well and i was just like i want community i want to be around people who like i fit in with because i'm not really finding that here and uh that worked though because now like i'm in we have a youtuber studio in toronto i work with uh like jay ray gokunaru we're in hell duncan clark like cj the x comes around like we have a huge thing going on here and the second one was I was uh, I was in a fine arts degree and I left Halifax to do a master's in fine arts in Ottawa. And being like really entrenched in academia, watching all these people who are like, it's so idiosyncratic when you're in university. Everything is self-referential. You're like trying to get published, especially as an artist, you're trying to get shows at universities. You're trying to get cred from other professors. Like it's, it's very insular. It has no impact on the outside world. Um, I mean, I knew artists who would you know do a show every week but had like 100 instagram followers and i just felt like i'm gonna spend all this money in two years of my life to get a level of fame as an artist and as a creator that i could easily achieve in six months with like dedication to the internet and dedication to social media and youtube so started for community now i'm pivoting more towards the art thing because that's what i want to do from the beginning is to be a full-time artist make stuff and not have to uh have a day job, not have to suck the dicks of professors and, and appease people in academia. I really like that answer, man. It seems like it's it came from a place of genuine like authenticity and want to kind of break out of the mold because I agree, even in my limited experience in academia, uh, and I have a lot of friends that are doing higher academia, getting their PhDs, getting their masters, it's kind of disillusioning because like you realize how just bureaucratic everything is and you do kind of have to suck the dick of like whoever your professor is um and if you're in certain uh industries and stuff in the corporate world it's very similar yeah. um being able to do your own thing and like follow your own passions create your own fan base is definitely the way to go especially for a guy as talented and kind of unique as yourself and uh one thing you touched on is like you've wanted to do art from the beginning I think that's very obvious when you watch your videos that you're an artistic guy, you're very talented. Um, who would you say are some of your main inspirations? Could be video, could be art, could be YouTube, could be just um, general pop culture. Like, who are people that you draw inspiration from today? I'll give you a. Uh, I'll give you three from uh, from different mediums. So YouTube. Is definitely I love like I love storytelling and I love like the craft of storytelling and I think this is pretty obvious I got I get this comment a lot actually but like Nikki Jakey if you know who that is yeah 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 um I mean yeah the the influence of the green screen is clear and and the humor but uh he's such a good like he's someone that personally I will drop everything to watch his newest video and there's very few people that I have that feeling towards where like I need to see what this guy did um like that's it's 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 so entertaining it's such good storytelling and there's always a good conclusion and it's one of those things where like i would hate to be in the position where if someone feels like they've wasted their time watching my video even if they watch it the mm -hmm. whole way through if someone's like "Fuck, i should have been doing something else i should have been working i should have been doing this thing i'm procrastinating i never feel that when i watch his videos i'm like i'm glad i consumed this this was an excellent piece of media so to to even come close to what he does would be would be a privilege um art as far as like painting goes, there's a uh, Edward Manet, who was an impressionist painter in a uh, late 1800s in Paris. And so this is the point in art where the beginning of modern art and modern art literally being where art used to be only for like depicting people in government or kings or like telling a scene or commissions. It was like a, it's like photo, like photography, like journalism, right? It was it wasn't art wasn't this idiosyncratic like academic practice the way we see it now with like modern art it was like a it was a craft the same way like making baskets is a craft right you mm. need someone needed to do it and so with the invention of photography 
and this it begins this shift into modern art where art has its own rules in and of itself it's not for anything anymore and uh the impressionists were the first big art movement to really encapsulate modern art but edward benet specifically who was like painting like during um the reign of napoleon the third when they were bulldozing parts of Paris to build like all the new boulevards and all these people were getting displaced. He was painting all the homeless people that were getting kicked out of Paris because their homes were being torn down and depicting all the people who were like, especially depicting like the new uh, bourgeois class, like the middle class that was forming in Paris at the time. Like this is the beginning of, that was literally the beginning of the middle class as the concept was Paris in the late 1800s. So he's painting these like, you know, people at parties and dinner parties and like going shopping at malls, like the first depictions of what we now see as Western middle class culture ever in history mm. um and he was very controversial at the time a lot of people really didn't like his work uh impressionism is actually that term was a uh, from a critic who said these paintings are so bad it's like the impression of a painting it's not a real painting so impressionist was a derogatory a, a derogatory term that they run they ran with so they were very controversial at the time and um music i think the uh as far as like work ethic goes there's a lot to be said for the uh, 80s, 80s hardcore punk. If you look at Black Flag, Dead Kennedys, Misfits, and, and uh, Minor Threat, these are uh, all uh, hardcore punk bands from the US in the early 80s. They were fucking straight edge, did not drink, did not do drugs. They all went to the gym. They all took care of their bodies. Henry Rollins and um, Glenn Danzig were both jacked, like 225 bench. All they cared about was aesthetics, took care of themselves, worked 80 hours a week, um, self-promoted, hated the fucking government weren't political were completely like just as as punk as you could be in the literal sense of like the most punk rock thing you can do is be your own agent and that involves taking care of yourself being virtuous being healthy and putting in the hard work not being like a shithead the way we think about punks now so like all those people that whole movement's insane and i feel like it really gets misrepresented when people say punk and they think of like a burnout or like a degenerate but it's like no punk is as um as like will to power as you could be yeah, dude, that's fascinating. Because, yeah, when I think of punk, I'm thinking of someone who's like a druggy, anti-establishment, but like in all the ways that also kind of go hand in hand with the kind of like hippie, you know, do it for yourself type vibe. Um, I never knew that they were like big punk scenes where guys were looks maxing, hitting the gym, doing like improvement type activities. That's really interesting. Yeah, and, that's so um, cool. Yeah, that is cool. I, I remember you made a video and you, you talked a lot about the impressionist type paintings and, and how uh, with the introduction of photography, everything was kind of flipped on its head because uh, you didn't need art to kind of, you know, have these historic moments put down in history and everything kind of switched where art had its own meeting. People were using art in different ways. Um, I think that with the Renaissance and with religion kind of dying out in a lot of parts of the world there's a parallel there just in life you know people always had a reason um and most people throughout history were religious in some sense but with that kind of dying out in a large percentage of the world um i see the parallel where there's not necessarily a strict reason to live and it seems like a lot of guys are turning to the black pill i think you touch on this on your channel a lot but general sense of nihilism, a general sense of there's no reason to do anything. And one of your kind of catchphrases on your channel is never kill yourself. Like, don't kill yourself. Um, it's something that's very memorable. It's something that I think goes very well with your brand. I want to hear kind of the history. Like, what what's the reason behind that? What was the history with that kind of slogan? Because I think that every single video kind of ends with that. Don't kill yourself. Never kill yourself. You're going to miss the big show. I want to hear, like, how yeah. that come about. I said it, um, yeah, I, I said, there's a, the video where, like, I'm, like, ranting at the end, and I think I just, like, say it in the rant. I'm, like, never kill yourself. Um, but I, I think, yeah, as, as uh, extrapolating that out into, like, just a farther, like, life-affirming, you like, you have to believe in yourself. Like, either literally, if you don't believe in a future, there is no future, right? Especially, mm. like you said, we're post- we're post, uh, not, to say really, not to say we're post-modern, because it's a little cliche, but we're, we're post-religious, we're post-truth. Um, if you want to get, like, really, kind of like, we live in a fucking society, but uh, you have to believe in something. Like, you have to believe that there's a better future. Yeah. You have to believe there's a better world in front of you, and you believing in that will make you more likely to actualize it and work towards mm. it. 
So I just like, I think suicide's one of those things that we, and like me as well, I make tons of edgy jokes, but it's like, I'm, I'm very, I'm very big in like, um, words as spells and kind of like words creating reality. Like I said, the hyperstition video was all about, and it's like, you, you know, suicide's an idea yeah. that we like toy with too much. Like, oh, there's no reason to live. There's no will to live. I have no will to live, blah, 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 blah. Whether you're joking or not, it's like, no, you need whatever it is. Like you have to find out. It's your duty, I think, to find out like why you need to keep going. Like that's that's our journey now. If we don't have religion, if we don't have progress, if we don't have like a higher power to look forward to, we have to like reconstruct that. We have to find a way to do that. Very true. Very true. I think that kind of segues perfectly into the next question I wanted to touch on. And um, it's kind of relating to spirituality and faith. I think everybody has their own unique journey with religion or with God, whatever you kind of label as God in your own life. Um, mine's been up and down, but I've kind of settled at a place of um, faith in Christianity. I'm involved in my church. I have kind of decided that this is the way I'm going to build my life. Um, and it's also very convenient for me because I grew up a Christian. My family's Christian. So uh, it's almost a path of least resistance. But I, I did have a phase where I walked away from my faith. I kind of was embracing nihilism and trying to make my own meaning out of the world. And I was never able to really create that meaning. I struggled greatly in that phase of life. And um, it ultimately kind of brought me back to a place of faith, a place of um, kind of embracing Christ and putting that at the center of my life. And in a bit of an odd way to talk about it, like I, I realize that there is a chance that none of that is true, but I'm kind of at peace with that because I think that Christianity is a good way to um, have a successful and fulfilling life, like leading that sacrificial life as a man. And um, the major tenets of Christianity do align with pretty much all my uh, moral compass like pillars I wanted to ask you what's your relationship been like with God and what's your spiritual journey been like because you kind of touch a little bit in your videos but you never go like too much in depth into your own into your own journey and experience I I wouldn't I, I wouldn't uh, I don't want to call myself a Christian because I'm not like I'm not very well read with like I was raised Catholic I was um I was baptized I did my first communion uh, I'm not very well read with the Bible. I'm not. I don't go to church. I've been like I've wanted to for a while, but it's one of those things that I haven't put as a top priority. I do pray, like I pray every night, but I wouldn't call myself like saying you're a Christian. Kind of begets like an understanding of of the thing. So I don't. I don't have that understanding. But I remember in 2020. So in a uh, right after the pandemic kind of got really bad. This is probably I think it's May or June 2020. The largest mass shooting in Canadian history took place in my hometown. Um, a guy, I don't know if you've heard about this, but a guy made an like an RCMP vehicle. He uh, made a fake RCMP vehicle, like the federal police for Canada, and just drove around like my area of where I grew up, killing people. Like he burnt down like five houses. I think he killed 18 people across an 18 hour long massacre that spanned a hundred kilometers from like my hometown to Halifax. Um, Golly. so I went back to my hometown it's mid pandemic. We can't do anything. I was at my friend's girlfriend's house and uh, I just had this like realization. I was like, Oh shit, this is why we have faith. Like, this is why we, <laughs> this is why we have religion. Cause I'm like sitting here. I'm like, the world feels like it's ending. And, um, you know, my dad's calling me saying like asking if I'm okay and saying that like, you know, um, people he know just got shot. And my friends are messaging me being like, holy fuck, my neighbor's house got burnt down. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, this is why we, this is why we have faith. This is the purpose of religion is to like interface with events like this. Cause this is fucking insane. So after that, I kind of got more in tune with, with spirituality and with religion. And I had a, I had a brief foray, foray, foray into uh, like new age spirituality. And I just kind of found like, Mm -hmm. I call it spiritual narcissism is people, especially like Gen Z, try to construct their idea like they're like, oh, I'm a spiritual. I believe in like a like something beyond consciousness and humanity. But because there's no objective, there's no rules, there's no material to it. It just allows you yeah. to justify anything you do as like spiritual. If you say like, I'm finding myself or like, oh, I, I felt like I needed to like leave my partner. I felt like I needed to like do this and do that. It really like 
it still puts you at the center of the world and it, it just gives you a moral system to justify any of your decisions because you're like a spiritual person so i think as i especially like i'm i'm 26 and i get more religious every day and um i like i've yeah i've started reading the bible i i pray i started like i used to pray in general to like god now i pray to like jesus specifically like i just feel yeah. like i've been getting I've been seeing as I as I become like a man, man, like I'm not like a young adult anymore. I really see the purpose of of religion and why it's really valuable to to find it and to stick to it and to just like get axioms you live your life by. I feel like a lot of people don't have axioms. They don't have first principles. Um, if you live your life from the first principle of like, I don't cheat, like I will never cheat or steal, then it's like you have these hard rules you never break. But when you're like, I don't cheat, but then sometimes I'll cheat if it benefits me, but I don't like cheating. You have this weird like workaround to it where you somehow justify your own shitty behavior. You're not going to be, you're not going to live a virtuous life because you can kind of allow yourself to do anything when it benefits you. That's so true. Yeah. I think one of the things you said that was very eye-opening to me and that I definitely agree with is that a lot of young people, a lot of Gen Z, we want all of the upside of something without making any of the sacrifice. So like, yes, maybe we yeah. want to be spiritual, but we want to do it on our own terms. We don't want to like align with anything where we have to truly make sacrifice. Um, yeah, that's, that's definitely true. And I see that as well. Um, and I agree. I, I think that a lot of younger men are starting to realize like there was kind of a phase maybe uh, in America and Canada where, in the West, it was seen as like edgy and cool to be like, you know, religion has like done all this terrible th like things for humanity. And like, I'm an atheist, I'm a nihilist, but I agree. You go through enough life. I think that most people kind of realize at some point that most of life is suffering and a lot of times seemingly meaningless suffering. <laughs> and there's this vacuum that kind of needs to be filled of, of a greater purpose of life, uh, of why we're here. And I think that another thing you said that's important is like the uh, the the aspect of religion where it's bigger than yourself. You know, my grandparents and my great grandparents we, we've all been Christians. It's just been kind of a thing throughout my family history on both sides. So um, a part of me kind of takes peace in saying like, okay, it was good enough for them. It's good enough for me. Like I'm not this great thinker. I'm not some philosopher who's gonna like figure out all the intricacies of the universe. Um, there's a sense of peace I feel in that. And it also it kind of connects me back to uh, my family and my roots and ancestors and all that. Um, so I think that there is a lot of value in religion, especially a sacrificial religion. Like you talked about Jesus and, um, you know, the Old Testament gets a little bit, it can get a little bit crazy in there, but like the New Testament, uh, the gospel specifically, it's a truly beautiful story of sacrifice and um, and and Jesus as a character in the Bible and as as uh, a savior. It's pretty incredible um, kind of archetype to live your life by. I think you're also right. You talked about how like you know having things you set in place. I don't steal. I don't cheat. I tell the truth. Kind of like unwavering pillars is the only way to truly live a fulfilling and also. Um, just life because at least me, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I can always justify in my head, like being able to work around and do all these, you know, logical, well, I can do this and this, and this is why I'm going to do it this time. But that's not really, um, it's not really the way to live a moral life. You have to have pillars that you just do not break. And I think that a society without God or without religion at all is going to inevitably kind of crumble at some point. Um, I want to kind of shift gears a little bit and, and hear about some of your plans in the future. It seems like you've got your fingers in a lot of different areas. You are making physical art. You have the YouTube channel. You have the podcast. Um, by the way, I'm going to link everything in the, in the description of this video. Go follow him on YouTube. Follow the podcast. Follow him on Twitter. But um, I want to ask you, if things go really well for you over the next five years, where would you like to see yourself at like 30, 30 years, you know, 30 years old, 31 years old, where would like your ideal version of yourself be in five years? YouTube's a weird game. I think a lot of people see YouTube as, as their out and not a means to an end, but there's very few creators, unless they're kind of 
I, I think you look at someone like Mr. Beast, who's a total glitch. No one should aspire to be Mr. Beast. I think that I think that's just like a you know like good form. I'm not gonna say it's luck, but it's uh it's a phenomenon for sure. People look at YouTube as as an oat, right? But I I really think it should be looked at as a means to other ends. You should f always have an exit strategy or begin to an exit strategy if you're gonna get big on YouTube, because like creators just don't like the light like your your lifespan's like five years if you're lucky. Um, Unless you're doing something that's like very real world, like a, like you're a political like journalist or like you're a pundit, mm -hmm. um, yeah, like I'm just making video essays. Like you're not, it's very unlikely you're gonna last a long time. So it's really good to figure out how to. I've always yeah, uh, from day one I've been like, how what does this go? Where where do I see this going? And it's like I see it going. I want to be painting primarily, writing. If I'm still doing YouTube videos, it would be like one a year, four hours long. I wouldn't see myself trying to make like weekly uploads anymore. But uh, that or or books, even like I'm a quit altogether. It's it's one of those things that like you 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 build your career on the internet and like you get eyes on you and people kind of determine your worth over that period of time. And then once you have that, I think you should find a way to like bounce off to the next thing. But that's a long ways away. Like I still I see I still see my channel as having. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a long, long, long ways to go before I before I get there. And yeah, and also not to get too personal, like you can take this wherever you want. But what about like in your own life? Do you have any personal goals? Do you want to have a family? Do you want to get married? Or are you just kind of letting like life come at you? I know some people don't like to make goals around like, you know, like I need to have a relationship by this point. I need to have a kid by this point. Um, but in your personal life, do you have any like major goals that you'd like to get done in the next five years? Next five years, oh, man, gr growing up, I, like, when I was younger, I was, like, I want a family young, I want, I, I really want a family, like, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a big family, and I wanted that young, but I think I just chose a path in life that's so entrepreneurial, I don't really have the mm -hmm. luxury of, like, being in a stable job, and I've accepted that, that's gonna have to wait, um, and which is scary, because I see a lot of people who, um, my friend, my friend JJ McCullough sent me a po a poll recently about like interviewing people who are childless on why they're childless, and one of the major answers was, I just like forgot. Time passed. It wasn't like an intentional like I'm gonna not have kids. It was like the years just went away. I was busy, and now I'm 38 and probably not gonna have children. So that's like I know I'm self aware of being in the same position that most people my age and older are in or were in where they're like, oh, I'm just going to work 10 more years, then I'll have kids. So I, I have a really like 35, at least at the, at the, at the very, very most 35. I want to have a, yeah, get the house and the, and the three to four kids and the wife and get that next phase of my life started. But being an entrepreneur, it's just, it's up in the air. I don't have that, that salary. I don't have that paycheck coming in. It's just, it, there's some, some months are really good. Some months I'm, uh, I'm like fasting instead of eating for certain days of the week. Cause it's like, you know, I could justify some uh, being broke as like a health move, but it's uh, <laughs> it's hard to say. It's hard to say. I don't like making too many plans. I just like yeah. focusing. Like, the, the, I'm, I'm like month to month. I'm like grow the business, grow the YouTube channel, <laughs> diversify income streams. Yeah, I'm, kinda, I'm right there with you, man. I think that's a healthy way to do it. Yeah, I have some friends that are like, I'm gonna have this. Like, I'm gonna be in this relationship, do this, 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 and it's like. Life's got a funny way of, of you know, making its own, uh, making its own things kind of happen, and you can kind of sit back and watch, or you can try to painfully twist things in its own way. But I think you got a great head on your shoulders, man. And um, are we the yeah, same age? I, I'm 24. I'm 24, 24, so a couple years younger. But I can definitely relate to the, um, yeah, economically, it's definitely like a intimidating thing today. Uh, I'm not trying to use that as like a cope. I definitely want to have kids and, and have a family and um, do the whole nine, but it is not a light responsibility. Like a couple of my friends now are starting to have kids and it's like, you know, not just economically, but it's just a huge, um, it's, it shifts your whole life towards being the provider, being the um, man of the house and, and being able to really boss up. So like it does kind of limit your, creative opportunities as like a young entrepreneur making these videos doing stuff um so i i definitely can relate uh and yeah as I mean, we kind of yeah. wind yeah go ahead i would i would, I would hate to uh, yeah, just expand on that right like I, I would hate to be um i work 
80 hours a week. Uh, I can't do that when I have kids. Yeah. And I don't want my wife to have to work. Right? I don't want it to be like a dual income family of necessity. I'd like to just get to a point where like I can work 40 hours a week, 30 hours a week, be the sole provider. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, just don't, I don't want to create a family where it's like, and ideally, I don't know, not to get, not to get too woo woo, but like put them in, I don't really trust public school. I'd like to put them in a, yeah. in a private school. I mean, yeah, dude, it's something that I've really thought, like, it's so easy to grow up and be like, I, I definitely want to, you know, like have a stay at home wife and, and homeschool my kids or put them in private school and all that stuff. But then, you know, now that I'm finally that age, it's like, well, that means I got to be raking in like real money. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and also, you know, finding a woman who's on that same page and, yeah, I feel like in my own experience, it's so easy to talk the talk, but then when it's time to walk the walk and I got to be like the guy who would lead that life, it's it's intimidating for me because, um, yeah, that's that's a big responsibility. Like my, my dad was um, very like just locked in, I guess. He had four kids. Um, my mom stayed at home and homeschooled us. And we didn't have the most luxurious life or anything, but like we had a very great upbringing and um, I'd love to recreate that if possible, but it's definitely like, you know, it requires you kind of bossing up and, and getting your shit in order. So I'm trying to do that and, and realize that it's not as easy as saying it, you know, it's all fun and games to kind of be like, yeah, I want like the trad lifestyle, but trad lifestyle ain't cheap. Yeah. So <laughs> you got to get right. Yeah, on I mean, that that's, the, that's the, that's the. There's a lot of, you know, the trad lifestyle, but definitionally it requires a lot of, uh, like you're saying, sacrifice, right? It requires yeah. you put yourself aside. You don't want to be traditional. You got to, you're working yeah. towards something a lot bigger than yourself. Did you have, um, yeah. did you, are you, do you feel like you're on a different, like you're maturing more than you were when you were like late teens, early twenties? Did you like party a lot or anything? Or are you just like a straight shooter? No, dude, I, I was, uh, like I partied a lot in college early and um, I actually got I got arrested my freshman year of college running from the police. I was uh, yeah crossed at an American football game. I went to NC State, and um, yeah I knew my parents were like they were gonna you know breathalyze me because they could tell I was intoxicated, and I like did the race, got tackled, and like had to go into debt. You know, it was terrible, but like had to get a lawyer, Jesus all the stuff. It's crazy, yeah. That was going. That was like in my phase of of you know. I'm, I'm way bigger than all this religious type stuff. And that's one of the things that, that actually kind of hum, humbled me enough to come back to my roots and be like, you know what? I don't think me taking control of my life and doing exactly what I want every second of the day is going to lead anywhere good. But yeah. um, no, definitely, definitely was not a straight shooter all the way through. But uh, recently have been really kind of just trying to focus in on what's going to lead me to the life I want. Um you know, when I'm, when I'm 30 and beyond. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm at a place of like peace with, you know, my decisions in life. It's just, it's interesting because I'm 24 now, but I don't feel, and you kind of touched on this, but like time is just passing and I don't feel like, I don't know. I don't feel like I'm changing that much. It's more just like what I expect for myself at the current age I am. Like, I don't feel like my brain now is like more mature it's just like i know i'm 24 so like i have to <laughs> make different decisions and kind of try to shape my life in a different direction if i know where i want to be when i'm 30. um i don't know if you can relate to that but yeah like nobody told me you don't really like grow up and feel grown it's just the time passes and then you're older yeah i um, Do you really there's a Author uh, Byung Chul Han, I don't know if you've heard of. You've heard a book called The Burnout Society, which is pretty popular. I've referenced it a few times, but all of his work, he's a philosopher. All of his work is very tiny, like sixty pages, little tr little treatises you can read. And he has one about the uh, talks about like the death of the milestone, the death of time passing. Is that our lives used to be kind of marked by these major milestones that you were expected to reach and had the ability to reach at certain ages in your life. And now, like, I think especially millennials and soon to be Gen Z are a big victim of this. But it's like you're just basically like 20 until you're 40. It seems like the new it seems like how things work out now. If you don't really like like you said, put yourself in place and be like, I'm now this age. I'm going to do these things. This is what a man this age is supposed to do. I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to work a lot harder. I'm going to stop partying like, unless you like set that intentionally. The world won't tell you to. And there's nothing waiting for you to do so. You can just like, 
You know, anybody can make 60, 70K a year, live in a nice one bedroom apartment and like drink three nights a week until they're 40, right? Like no one's gonna stop you from doing that. And all the milestones that you had to achieve are like just, they're not, they're not there anymore. So you really kind of build, you really got to build your own reality now. Yeah, dude, that's, that's very true. And it's something that like, yeah, when you see it, it's almost like a sad, I don't know. I don't know how close you are to like, um, you know, a major city. I guess you said you live in like around Nova Scotia area. Oh uh, no, um, I live in, uh, I'm uh, downtown Toronto. So I'm in a oh, huge, Toronto. huge okay. city. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So it's like, yeah, you, you see those guys like in their early 30s kind of living that same lifestyle as like the, you know, early college drinking all the time, not really any real responsibility. And it's this almost like sadness of like, you know, I don't think that that's where we need our, our young men in society. Um, but it's easy to kind of fall into that trap. And I think with a culture that's very self-indulgent and narcissistic, it's it's very it's easier than people think to kind of fall into that lifestyle of, like you said, getting a comfy corporate job, going out, hanging out, golfing with the boys. But then, like, you kind of realize um, life detached from responsibility is often not as fulfilling in the long term as you might think. It's interesting. I grew up, like, in a smaller town in North Carolina, and a lot of it, my friends were Hispanic. I was actually a minority in my high school, so it was mostly, like, Mexican kids and a lot of them started having kids early and stuff. And I've seen in my friends that have had kids and families early, they're working all the time, they're busy, they're stressed out, they're, you know, sleep deprived. But when I see them with their families and stuff, like it's, it is like a genuine sense of like, you know, fulfillment and yeah, it's interesting. It's a roundabout way of finding like happiness and fulfillment as a man is almost like not chasing what you think is going to make you happy, but le leading that sacrificial life and um, providing. But that, that also, you know, like you have to find a woman, you have to, I mean, there's a lot of things that have to happen in the first place. So it's interesting, but it's just kind of like infinite opportunities in life can almost be worse rather than a good thing in certain situations. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, before we end up the podcast, I wanted to ask you another thing about, um, your creative outlets and stuff. When did you start making art? And do you remember like the first video you ever made? Was it a YouTube video? Was it like a personal project? I wanted to kind of go back to your roots as an artist and a creator. What were some of the first kind of pieces you worked on? Um, I'm a weird, I'm a weird artist. I, I, a lot of the artists, especially in art school that I knew, and still know are very um i mean J Rig's like this it's like he they can't help but make art all they do is like they compulsively do it like um J Rig compulsively writes scripts and songs and poems and like explores his own ideas it's like he can't help do it i've known plenty of painters who are plenty of like just visual artists who are like are just constantly it's all they do is like draw write paint like they can't stop themselves but I wasn't, I'm not like that. And I was never like that. Like I was not into art until I was like 16. And I remember like one night I was bored and I drew uh, like a portrait of somebody and it was like weirdly good. And I was like, oh, maybe I'm like, I'm not going to say I'm like an amazing artist. Like, uh, but I was like, oh, wait, maybe I have like a natural, a natural inclination to like draw this. Cause I drew like a portrait of somebody and it was like a really w well done portrait for a 16 year old who'd never drawn before. Um... So that's how I got into it. But even still, like when I paint, I, I, I don't like I'm not like sketching all the time or like drawing people on the train or like drawing my friends. I'm just like I go, I sit down, I do one painting because I like doing painting faces, but it's a uh, it's not like compulsive. And then mm. with YouTube, I, I, I made like some shit in high school and some shit when I was in uh, a little kid. But the first thing I ever made was it's still on my channel. It's called Alternatives to Terror Management. And I was trying to. It's really funny looking back because it's a three minute video <laughs> and I was positing that like the um, the the root fear of being human isn't death, but the fear of being misunderstood. And it's really funny to me that I tried to I like that. explain that concept in three minutes where I'm like, I'm like positing like a like a shift in reality that everyone's been wrong their entire lives for the entire of human history up until I figured this out. And I'm like three minutes talking to a camera. That's going to make it. 
That's awesome, man. Yeah, that is yeah. funny. Well, it's, it's not that, you know, you don't want to get too deep. Just cover the basics. A little three-minute video yeah. on a very deep topic. Um, now, before, this is probably the last question, and I'll let you link all your stuff. Uh, I definitely want anyone who watches this video to go follow him on all his platforms because easily one of the best YouTubers out there. Um, very talented artist. Go follow before, you know, before you forget and click on the next video that hops up on your FYP. But um, one of these days, you know, I'm going to take my last breath. You're going to take your last breath. We're both going to die. What do you want your legacy to be? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> it's a bit of a deep question <laughs> to end on, but I definitely want to hear that. Jeez. <laughs> Jeez, I just want to. I don't know. I don't. I, I don't want a legacy of 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 a specific. I think what's important to me is that I, I don't have a. I don't have a legacy of like speci like a specific act. Like I did a thing or like made a thing or wrote a thing where it's like ah the guy who did that. Um, I don't know. I just want to be. I, I want to be virtuous. You know. I mm. want to be like. This is where I'll, I'll tell you a little story without getting too uh, too long here. But when my my dad died two years ago. And when he died, there was this weird, like, it wasn't like everyone was just, like, sad. Like, he was sick. He was 65. Like, he was older, but he was still pretty young. Um, and it wasn't like everyone was just, like, miserable and sad and being like, oh, God, what do we do? Everyone, like, my whole extended family, all of his friends, anyone that came to the funeral was like, wow, like, what a great man. And it was, like, this kind of, like, cold, like, loving comfort of, like, this was a really good man. He was. He was a fun, an amazing man. Like, he was just the most stand-up. Like, everyone loved him. Everyone adored him. No one ever said a bad word about him in my entire life. Um, and he was just, like, he's very virtuous. Always did the right thing. Always put other people first. And it was very beautiful. And I was just, like, I felt the same way. So if I can die with that legacy of just the people who knew me, like, liked me and felt like I was uh, a benefit to their lives... That's, I don't know, that's all one can ask for. Is that, like, I made the people who I leave behind better? I like that answer, man. I saw a video not too long ago, and it was, um, it was at a funeral, and it was, like, something, like, the guy had, um, had asked to be played at his funeral, and it was, like, him in the coffin down there, and everybody was kind of around when they played it, and it was, like, this deep Irish Southern, like, accent, like, you know, Galway accent, and the guy was, like, you know, like, banging on to something like let me out like let me out down here like playing a joke and everybody as sad as they were at the funeral like people were kind of joking around and like you know remembering him and i was reading the comments of the video and it was just like you just know that this guy was like the fucking man to like even beyond his grave like he's bringing smiles to his loved ones he's offering this like comfort to them um it, it, it kind of emotionally even now like it's almost like an emotional thing as a guy to be like you know, as a man to leave a, a mark on your loved ones where even in the darkest and like most painful and confusing of situations, something like death um, to, br to bring a sense of peace and happiness and like bringing smiles to people's faces. And it kind of made me come to a similar conclusion that if I can leave a mark like that, uh, even, you know, beyond my own death, like when I'm not here anymore, I still kind of can bring a smile and like people remember me as a, someone who was a virtuous man who was sat, like led a sacrificial life um i would be very fulfilled and like honored to have that legacy and it sounds like you and me are both lucky to have you know dads that that um were very good men and uh yeah that's that's a little bit of a uh sad and, <laughs> and serious way to end the podcast but dude i really appreciate you coming on um you're easily one of my favorite YouTubers. I really like the podcast too. I think you're a very smart guy and you have a cool way of putting things in your own words and um, your own creative outlet is like very, um, it's unique. And you're one of the creators like you talked about whenever I see you drop a video, I like carve out some time of the day or like if I can, if I'm not at work, I just stop what I'm doing. I watch the video. I always look forward to it. Your humor is great. And um, yeah, thanks for coming on the podcast and just keep doing what you're doing. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I, uh, no, this is an inspiring conversation as well. I feel, I feel invigorated too. Uh, I was writing all day. After this, I'm just like, fuck yeah, right back to writing. Like, I feel pretty invigorated from this. So thank you for having me. Dude, absolutely. Let's, let's do it again, guys.
Go check out his stuff. Like, comment, subscribe. We'll catch you in the next one.